of uh, tools that we have developed for the for the Darwin robot. Uh, it's uh, we have discovered that uh, in our lab it was really useful to use uh, ROS for our for our robot. So we have decided also to build the the ROS robot for the Darwin robot, and we will show you uh, what I'm capable of doing with that. The advantages of uh, using ROS, I think, everyone up here. You have used for formerly ROS, or at least you have heard about it. So you know there are a lot of tools that are capable uh, that are available on ROS, like uh, simulators, visualization tools, tools for making logs, everything. And also you have access if you have your uh, robot on the ROS workspace, then you have access to uh, a lot of algorithms. Let's say obstacle avoidance, navigation, arm navigation and uh, stuff like that. So we thought that it was really interesting having also the, the Darwin robot in that framework. This is an initial development that it's, uh, we have a lot of things uh, made to do, to, to do this happen, but it is still working on progress, so we have a lot of things to do still. But we will try to present you our last uh, developments. This is what we will present today. So we have our robot, you will see that mechanically is a little bit different from the uh, uh, standard uh, Darwin. I will try to introduce little by little to you all the changes that we have made. But regarding the soft, what we have done is uh, making that Darwin open ROS layer. Okay, this enables uh, the Darwin software to be visible in ROS. And we have developed also on other kind of uh, modules. First one is the model for teleoperation. Okay, maybe maybe with that one is better. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have developed that teleoperation module. Okay, this is something that all we all we need that is trying to execute things on the robot based on a on a remote sensor on a remote controller. Sorry, we have also developed a navigation. This is with a with a walking algorithm. Okay, we are able to uh, give commands to the robot and let the robot execute them. We have also developed an arm navigation module. Okay. We have added an additional degree of freedom and rather stuff in the, in the arm, and we, were, we wanted also to be able to uh, execute commands using the arms of the Darwin. And finally, we have introduced a, a new camera, we'll introduce them before, for uh, having a more uh, perception of the environment using, using the robot. Uh, last thing, everything is licensed as LGBL, so you can download our software, you can try it in your, in your robot. We will be really, really, really happy if uh, someone decides to collaborate and to create something that grows with the community. So we are open to change, to add, to revise the bugs that we have in the code and everything. And this is the repository. Okay, so the first model that, I will, that we will show today is the operation module. We will show this because it enables us to show a lot of things that we have done. First of all, there is the action interface. Okay, so this lets us to interface actions on the robot with the uh, ROS uh, workspace. Uh, we have made a uh, Darwin OP model, that is the, the specification of the, of the robot in terms of, uh, of the geometric modelization of the different uh, parts of the robot and also the different degrees of freedom. And this allows us to use that model in order to see in a RIS, that is a visualization tool that it's uh, mainly used in, in ROS. And this allows us having a, a realistic uh, visualization of it, what is happening on the robot. And finally, we have uh, used the Wii mode. So this is the, the remote controller of the, the Wii console in order to uh, be able to send comments to, to the robot. This is exactly the same kind of command that we are using for <coughs> all the other robots in our lab. So we have a demo here for you now. Now we have also additional buttons. It is just, this was just asking the robot to walk a little bit, but we have additional buttons. And the great thing that we have with that interface is that we can also change the behavior of the buttons. For example, here you have uh, dynamically, we have reconfigured two actions. So now the one button of the, uh, of the Wii mode will serve to uh, uh, go down to the robot, for example, that thing. And the second button of the robot, it serves to go up, stand up the, the robot. And you see that the visualization, it does more or less the same thing. The only thing here is that uh, there's a 
the center, the zero of the robot is in the, in the stomach of the robot, so you see the, the legs moving instead of the robot, the robot going down, but this is just a matter of changing the, the, the position of the reference in the, in the simulation, or in the visualization, sorry. And what we wanted to show here, it was that if you have all actions implemented inside of the robot, then you can dynamically change the behavior of your, of your command uh, and ask the robot doing that, executing that actions at real time. This is useful because if we have uh, different actions on the, on the robot, then we can ask it uh, to do one or the other very quickly without having to reprogram anything. You don't have, you don't have to touch any, any line of code to do that, just a matter of dynamically changing the behavior of the, of the controller. I to show you. This was for the, for the teleoperation. The next thing is the walking, uh, the walking interface. Okay, we have also a next uh, part of the ROS layer that we call the walking interface, and uh, it does a, uh, what the name says, that is interfacing the walking, uh, the walking apparatus of the, of the robot. And uh, we have on that part the same, the same uh, modules as before, so we have the model of the Darwin, and we have the visualization on RVs, and what we have done now is uh, with RVs you can send commands to the, to the robot asking him to walk a little bit, also with one direction. And what we have done with this is generating that targets on that environment and having an navigation module that controls that thing and makes things happen. This means that we are reading the odometry of the robot, so we have to program kind of odometry for that robot, but for the moment it's just uh, knowing the steps that he's doing and iterating that, but it can be done more efficiently or more intelligently. And with that, we close that loop and we make the robot walking. So we have also another demo for that. We will change. Yeah. Okay, it's here. So you have here the interface of the of the robot as before. Sorry. And now, using just the mouse, we are able to create some comments to the robot. This is as uh, is usually done for uh, bigger robots using ROS. For example, for the PR2, is done exactly the same way. So this is how commands are done. So we ask the robot go to that direction. In that representation, each one of that steps is one meter. So we have asked the robot going there. And now we can also give a slight turn to see that the robot also gives that next step. So we have that on the battery, so you see that the robot has made more or less that trajectory. And you have seen also that while the, uh, while the robot was walking, we did the isolation the also was showing what happened on the on the on the release of freedom of the robot. Okay. So let's go for the next one. Okay, so for the next one, instead of uh, using the legs, we will start using the, the arms. So what we have done, you, you can see here with the, the robot, is uh, adding two degrees of freedom. The nice thing with that, it was that uh, we, did not, we did not have enough uh, MX-28 motors, so we decided to use the former uh, AX-12 motors, and it was how, how, uh, somehow quite difficult to integrate that on the structure of the, of the robot. So we developed what we call the joint interface, that it's uh, an interface on robots that uh, it's able to accept uh, angles and it produces uh, the joint positions of the motors independently of the model of the, mo the, the motor that uh, they are. And also we have other the two grippers on the, on the hands to be able to, be able to read things on the, on the environment in the future. So this is, uh, from the hardware point of view, from the server point of view, this is the, the arm that we have, okay? Now we are giving a target manually, and uh, what we have developed is an arm navigation module that sends comments to the robot. But this cannot be done straightforward. We have first to rely on an inverse kinematics module, okay? So what we have done is a real inverse kinematics module with that 40 years of freedom robot. Uh, arm, sorry, 
And we ask, when we have a 3D point on the environment, we ask for the Inbus kinematics on the joint position, as is known as uh, commonly on Inbus kinematics, and with that solution we come at the robot. And this is general. There is not some predefined positions on the space that we know that the, the, the joint position of the robot, but this is uh, mapping all the space into the joint positions of the robot. And here we have also a couple... Okay. Here we have also a couple of uh, demonstrations. So first, we will send a position in the space to the robot. So now it will start moving. So he prepares. He moves the arm. This is a 3D position of the space. He closes the the gripper and he will return it to the position. We are using the inverse kinematic, that means that we know if the position in the 3D space is reachable by the robot or not. Okay? The second demonstration that we have to prepare, first we will send to the robot a position that is not in the in the space, in the working space of the robot. So the robot first approaches to that point. And once this and once this has been done, then he moves the, the arm and the ripper to that uh, 3D position of the space. So what we prepared here, it was just a simple demo to show that it was more or less general. So we know we knew previously if the position was in the in the working space of the robot or not, and the robot acts accordingly. Also, we have prepared the same, but with the other hand. So we have the Roskamari for both hands. That is not uh, strange because it's once you have the one for the one hand, it's not difficult to find the, the corresponding hand. And here you have, you see that we have what what you have asked to the robot is a position that is in the other side of the of the body. So he has decided instead of using its uh, left arm, using its right arm to reach that position in the space. Last, uh, the last demo that we have prepared is that one we have added a time of flight camera to that robot. This is a camera that, like Kinect, gives you depth in one image, so you have now the sense of depth into the robot and you are able to interact with the world in that sense. Okay? Using just the color camera, this is usually done by knowing what you are seeing. For example, if you are looking at the world in the, in the demo, you know how much pixels it should, uh, it, it, should uh, represent it, it should be represented in the image, so you know if you are far off or, or, or near that wall. Uh, when, you are not, when you don't have that kind of information in your robot, so for knowledge about, knowledge about the, the objects that you are facing, then you need that kind of data on your robot if you want to be able to interact with it. Kinect cameras are big. We've had formerly worked with our time of flight cameras that they were also big, but now we have access to that such a small and tiny cameras that give us that kind of information also. So what we have developed is the camera interface, and in that case is not a color camera interface, but a time of flight camera interface. So what we are obtaining is a 3D point cloud from the head of the of the robot, and also we have integrated all the, the the frames into the model of the robot, and we are able to see what the robot sees from the point of view of the robot, also the visualization. And this is the last demo that we have prepared. We can just rotate a little bit. We can rotate a little bit the scenario to see that this is a real 3D point cloud. And if I put something in the middle, you see my hand appearing. You see my hand appearing in 3D. And everything is in, the, in 3D from the point of view of the robot, so now the robot knows if uh, the thing that it has in front is uh, far from the robot, so he can, he can, for example, continue walking, or that thing is really close to the robot, so he has to stop because this is an, an obstacle, or, for example, if this is something that he wants to grasp, if he's in the, in the good uh, distance for grasping or not. Okay, so this, that was the last demo that we wanted to show you, and uh, we are a long-term activity in our research center, so we are not just uh, presenting uh, that demo today, but doing more things in our lab. So we wanted just to spend one more minute explaining you what are, what, on what we are working. So we have worked a little bit on a new firmware for the, for the CM750. Uh, observing what's happening on each step of the robot, we have 
the uh, embedded PC here. We have the uh, microcontroller here and the chain of motors on the other side. And what happens exactly now inside of the funeral that you have is that everything is uh, performed in the uh, feed PC and the CM uh, microcontroller is just relying on that, all that uh, information. And this is somehow time consuming for the PC and we need the, the cycles of the PC for other things, for example, for uh, the camera and navigation and stuff. So we have been working on switching that uh, motion manager, the world interaction, the head, everything to the real microcontroller. And we have now that working on our robot and uh, we have done some measurements on the time, and here they are. And you see that when the robot is with the old firmware doing, just standing up, even not working, we, are, we have a process here consuming somehow a lot of cycles of the PC. And with the new firmware, what we obtain is that it's almost consuming nothing, and that was a walking experiment. So the robot was walking here, not on the first one. So we have really improved a little bit the time, consum the time consumption on the, on, the, on the robot. And the last two things that we wanted to present you, first thing is that we have developed a three-finger copy and hand. Is that one? Okay. This is because we want to have the ability to grasp complex things with that robot. And so we have uh, developed, this is still working on progress, so we have not integrated on the robot, but it's planned to do it. Uh, these three fingers are very much just one degree of freedom. We are able to close the hand and adapt to the, to the object that we are grasping. And the last thing is that we have uh, also uh, a new battery model that we are developing. Now we have made some tests and the robot can handle up to 50 minutes, 15 minutes of autonomy. And we are interested in increasing that autonomy, but not only that, but giving the capability to the robot of auto-charging, so finding itself the charger and uh, charging the batteries. And this needs uh, complex, more complexity on the, on the electronics that control the battery, and we are working on, on that. So thank you very much for, for your attention, and we are open to questions.